Okay. <clears throat> Seaports and terminals, important part of this uh, international uh, transport network. Uh, <coughs> definitions are always good to to start with. Uh, so to be clear about what we mean with a port, for instance. Um <coughs> Port may be a quite complex structure, as was shown on the on the lecture. Constitutes of serv several terminals uh, serving different needs, <coughs> uh, like, for instance, container handling. Uh, there are different owner structures of, of a port, which is always which is uh, also listed in the in the lecture, uh, the main lecture, and also in the in the literature. So there are different ownership structures. Um, this is uh, some characteristics. <coughs> Used to be very labor intensive. Some ports are still quite labor intensive. Uh, the ones who deal with general cargo, pallet, pallet palletized cargo, is still fairly intensive when it comes to labor. Whereas uh <coughs> some of the container ports, one shot here. Uh, is 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 then coming capital intensive and automized. Automated. That means again <coughs> that we have this uh, increasing returns to scale pattern in in production, which also comes into play when we talk about ports, especially this kind of ports with quite uh, modest manning and a uh, and, uh, strong focus on, on equipment. So ports are also now <coughs> subjected to this uh, concentration with uh, dedicated uh, port owners who may have their hands on, uh, on, uh, on many ports. So you get also consolidation on the, on the ownership side here. Which is also a concern for the for the way this uh, this market works in terms of competition. I mean, if one owner has uh, has their hands on the big ports in, uh, let's say, in the Netherlands, Belgium, if they get common ownership, it can be uh, it can be an issue when it comes to competition. Private capital uh, is is employed here in through public-private partnerships, um, where the terminals are are private. We have this uh, this hierarchy of ports, where you have uh, the the main hub ports, the feeder ports, and the local ports. Three different levels mainly. And this is particularly uh, pronounced when it comes to this uh, container market, this strongly growing market. Uh, and the <coughs> returns to scale effect is, is, in, is, is higher, of course, here for the big hub ports than here, where we have uh, this local port can handle a few containers per day, uh, but not very capital intensive. May, maybe the capital is more or less uh, based on the uh, on the roll on roll off equipment. The feeder ports <coughs> may have uh, uh, gantry cranes uh, dedicated to to container handling, and these are the really big ones that I showed you on the previous slide. So to be aware of this hierarchy is, uh, and the structure is 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 good. Then we have all the different port functions, I just uh, list them here. Um, we see the, the functions, the interface <coughs> between the ship and the, and the terminal, um, and then the, the transit functions, which takes care of the cargo, uh, link, them, link the cargo up with other transport modes, and so on. Storage functions, <coughs> and here we may also have uh, third-party logistics service providers involved to do 
pre-delivery inspections and uh, labeling, packaging, and so on, which uh, together with the service functions could be very important for, for a port. Because as I showed you, then you can sort of split the, the fixed costs onto, onto not only the cargo throughput, but also to also split it onto the service functions. And that could also improve <coughs> the, the, the competitive position of, of the port. All the other uh, things that goes with the, with the port services. Here we have this third party logistics part mainly. Uh, again, <coughs> competition. Um, private capital, this alliance between ship owners and ports, which we also see within the airline industry, where airlines and airports are, uh, are uh, especially in the US, they have been strongly integrated. And uh, the positive side of integration is that you get, uh, you may be more efficient in terms of capacity utilization. The downside of this <coughs> is market concentration again. So it's the same story all over again. So one question for you perhaps could be then to explain the role of or discuss the role of uh, scale efficiency in international transportation. And then you can elaborate on ports and uh, and ships, hub and spoke systems, and and the like, which is also about exploiting uh, scale effects. Yeah, we have this this phenomenon is uh <coughs> is evident in uh, in this country. Um, Re regional monopolies, perhaps with resulting overinvestments in uh, in uh, in ports, where ports have a a local, let's say, a local monopoly. In many cases, you have one port in a within a in a community, <coughs> and they can actually exploit their market power. One <laughs> slight, let's say, symptom of that is like in this, in Molde here, uh, the port is also a big real asset owner. They own a hotel and uh, things like that. So they have obviously been able to accumulate a lot of capital over the years. And capital accumulation is a sign of, of weak competition, that they are able to earn quite high profits. Then <coughs> we went on with environmental performance of transport modes and tried to, to say something about um, how to measure environmental impacts. We, uh, we looked on, on this causes and effects uh, diagram where <coughs> emissions, certain types of emissions has certain impacts. And in the end here, you try to monetize the costs of all these, uh, let's say all these chemical reactions and processes that leads to, let's say, global warming and other environmental costs for the, for the global society. And we try to, f to find, to determine what costs should be imposed on the use of fossil fuels to be able to balance this. Let's say, how much should a ton of CO2 cost for, for the EU to be able to, to maintain their, uh, their new emission goal of minus 40% within 2030? 
it's hard to see that they can achieve that without having a, a quite steep increase in uh, in uh, in carbon taxes. This is the this the logic goes from top here with emissions and then the impacts and then the costs of the impacts and then try to convert that into some some charge for uh, for uh, for emissions of uh, certain substances. Some <coughs> number again. Uh, this is uh, CO2 in grams per metric ton of freight per transport mode, kilo kilo kilometer of transportation, <coughs> or minimum and maximum, depending on the type of vessel and the uh, and the payload. Because if you if you run half empty aircraft, the the emission per ton kilometer will be very high uh, as compared to to full full loads. And there are also different types of aircraft as well as for uh, and that goes also with trucks and trains and so on. But this <coughs> should not be taken as a as a kind of a recommendation to avoid aircraft use of aircraft and just to focus on, on sea transport because it depends on distances. <coughs> it depends on case specific uh, issues like, like the payload. And it also depends on the technology employed in the production process. A very simple example is that you can fly in perishables from uh, from let's say Africa to replace greenhouse grown perishables in in Europe so you don't need the heated greenhouses for uh, growing tomatoes or uh, flowers or whatever you can take in, take them from countries with a with a warmer climate <coughs> and then you avoid a lot of uh, energy use for for heating but you will then, of course, uh, have more emissions from transportation. But the total picture may still be positive in favor of, uh, of a long distance transportation, but with a very lean production technology in other, pl in other parts of the world. So this picture is not, <coughs> not the final, it should not give you, let's say, the final conclusion of what, what transport mode to, to employ. But it's a, it's a more, a, more or less a unit where it gives an interval of the, of the emissions per, per vehicle or per ton kilometer per transport mode. And uh, one of the papers <coughs> have this conceptual model for calculations of uh, environmental effects where you need a lot of input data on the vessel specifications, case input data which goes with transport distances, load factors and so on. And then you have um, energy use data. And this can be used to calculate emissions. I had a very, very brief example on the, on the blackboard in one of the lectures. In more detail, <coughs> You have a model like this, which is also described in one of the papers. Uh, and this is for, um, let's say, for a ship, where we have the power of the engines, main engines and auxiliary engines. You have the workload, and you have the specific fuel consumption for the engine types in grams per kilowatt hour of effect. So if you have a a power here of 2,000 kilowatts, a workload of 50%, which then you, you run the engine at half speed, if you, if you like, then the kilowatt hour number that should be used here is not 2,000, but it's 1,000 if you use half of it, right? So that is, that is why we use the total effect, the workload, the resulting effects, and then we have data for specific consu fuel consumption. And the same with, <coughs> with, uh, 
with the auxiliary engines. And then you get direct fuel consumption. <coughs> and then you should then add into this the, the, the distance of relevant leg and the speed, and then you get the time. Because this is per hour, then you need time to calculate total emissions or, or uh, total energy use. <coughs> and um, we end with, by doing this exercise, we end with primary energy consumption per ton of this, uh, this, uh, this transport. And if we have other transport modes, like trucks, heavy goods vehicles, uh, we need to do the same exercise for that. And to include also the heavy goods vehicles part of this transport chain, and to calculate the emission costs. But the main source <coughs> is the um, engine effect, the F, the, the the workload of the engines, uh, the payload of the vehicle is important to, to derive the primary energy consumption per ton. And in principle, it's the same type of calculation for all the transport modes. It's just different data, uh, different engine sizes, different payloads, different, <coughs> different specific fuel consumption. And if you get something like this on the exam, you will get. I will. I will give you the data on, on, on these. Um, let's say which are contained in these boxes, but you need to understand the sequence and the procedure for calculating the the <coughs> energy consumption, which is not difficult. And if you read the paper by uh, by Yelle, it should be quite clear how you how you do this. I mean, he refers to specific case studies where this is this is done. Yeah. So this is just a conclusion on uh, <coughs> on whether sea transport is is green or not, and uh, and he he has done some case studies which are are presented in the papers and also in the in that uh, environmental. Uh, impacts lecture. So <coughs> there is a reason to be cautious about uh, drawing general conclusions. Need to address space case specific issues. If you can go more directly with sea transport instead of uh, longer distance by road, it's uh <coughs> it's. Uh, that sea transport can be uh, can be uh, energy efficient. Uh, ideally, as I said, if you compare, let's say, air transport with other transport modes, you should also should also take the uh, production of the cargo into consideration. Uh, I mean, the energy use in the production process into consideration. If you move goods over longer distances, you may benefit from from a, from a cleaner production process in terms of energy use in in other parts of the world. So there is a lot of factors <coughs> that are uh, that are uh, that needs to be be addressed, and which are then uh, a part of your your readings to to check out. Well, this was this was part one on the, on the, on maritime. I think the second part will I will move a bit faster, uh, so we can uh, discuss a bit all right <coughs> then I need to use this one.
So <coughs> we'll um, we'll deal with uh, with the other lectures and uh, we'll start with this uh, international trade lecture. Um, to be able to to sort of have an impression of the development in uh, in world trade, um, which where do does the main trade flows go? Um, and then also to be able to to understand why international tr uh, trade is beneficial and what may be also some of the adverse consequences of international trade is uh, is good this is just a description which is given in the literature and in the in the lecture notes from that lecture uh, <coughs> but I, I wanted to give you also a theoretical uh, introduction to this um, because you will sooner or later, if you are going to work with international transportation, you will sooner or later um, be introduced to this uh, this rather complex topic. Um, so we try to understand, to introduce you to these four points. Why countries do trade? How does it tr uh, trade affect production and consumption in each country? How does it affect the well economic well-being and the distribution of welfare between groups within each country? So if you can answer these four questions on uh, on next Saturday, it should be uh, you should be uh, okay at the exam. I think, perhaps, who knows? <laughs> uh, <coughs> this is the workhorse. Of uh, of this uh, this uh, theory, and and uh, one of you asked about uh, this uh, to, to try to discuss this a bit when we uh, consider um, exam and the, uh, one of the exam exercises. But we can just say that there are two countries. We can take it right away here: a high cost country and a low cost country with different <coughs> different patterns of uh, supply which are the increasing the curves that increases because uh, as you expand capacity uh, the cost of production increases because it's uh, it's uh, it's more expensive to expand capacity when you have uh, some production capacity available at the outset. This can be quite steep, as we see here, or it can be quite <coughs> not that steep, as we see here. It's more elastic, so it's cheaper to expand capacity in a low-cost country than a high-cost country, as I have illustrated it here. So the <coughs> the elasticity of this uh, this supply curve can be quite low like the or quite high like this or it can be quite low like this it means that uh, it's expensive to expand capacity <coughs> and the same with the demand if the demand is uh, is at this level as compared to this level this means that the willingness to pay or the ability to pay for the product is lower in this low cost country than in the high cost country because the demand curve in the high cost country is let's say it's more at at this level so the willingness to pay is much higher you can see per <coughs> if you charge 2000 you will still have 40000 units sold in the high cost country if you try something like that here you wouldn't have any sales at all Nobody will are willing or able to pay two thousand. <coughs> so, <coughs> obviously, the low cost country has its advantages in terms of producing this uh, this uh, this product. The case was was motorcycles. Um, and you have a you have an equilibrium here at the outset in the low cost country, fifty thousand units at uh, $700 sales price 
whereas in the high cost country, the equilibrium is 40,000 units and the sales price is 2,000. So if you, <coughs> if you open for trade here, um, the equilibrium will be where the costs in each market, each of the markets are the same, and where exports equals imports. That is a short story. The prices are equal, no incentives to increase imports, no incentives to decrease imports because the prices are the same. <coughs> and when the prices are the same, we, we get a volume that is moved from the low cost to the high cost country, defined by the exports, imports, which in this case is equal to, to 50,000. 75 minus 25. So the amount traded here is, is 50,000. <coughs> and then we can start to examine what will actually go on here. Well, in the low cost country, <coughs> if we get the new global equilibrium price of 1,000, because of this demand structure with rather elastic demand, the domestic demand for motorcycles in this case would be reduced to 25. So be a strong reduction in, in local demand in the local country because of this trade that takes place. The producers, <coughs> they will have to increase the production by 25 uni 25,000 units up to this level. So they, the, so the export is a composite of demand that is sort of moved from the domestic market and to the international market. That is one effect. And the other effect is increased production with 25,000 units. So the total is 50,000 units. So the, <laughs> let's say the global market for imports and exports are, are given by this, uh, this illustration in the middle. This is the demand for, for uh, imports and exports because and the reservation price here is 2000 because if, if the price would be set about 2000 the, the domestic uh, industry would, would supply uh, those those units, so the <coughs> the demand curve for the Im imports and exports starts here, and the equilibrium is here with the globe price, uh, global price, global equilibrium price of thousand, and the volume is fifty thousand, right? So in the low cost <coughs> market, the consumers are suffering, they lose because they have to pay more. Some of them are, are willing to pay more. So this area is transferred from the remaining 25,000 consumers and to the producers because they get a higher price. So this rectangle here is transferred wealth or money from the consumers that used to get it cheaper, they used to get it for 700, but they are still willing to pay 1,000. So a transfer of $300 per unit is given to the, handed over to the, to the producers. So this, <coughs> this triangle here is, uh, is the willingness to pay for the cons uh, from the consumers in the low cost market, but that is not enough to pay the new equilibrium price. So that's why these 25,000 units are not sold domestically anymore, they are exported to the high cost country. And this is increased production, which will be then uh, with at the cost 
according to this area. This is the production costs, which is, uh, it's a cost, it's not a, not a revenue, but, but uh, additional revenue will be equal to a triangle equal to this size. This will be the additional revenue from increased production. So if I ask you to do some calculations, <coughs> if that should be the case, because I never make the exams before I have given this lecture, not to slip my tongue, you know. But you can, and I can just uh, ask you to, to use some numbers. You can actually make up the numbers yourself. Uh, I can ask you to do that. Uh, and then you can use, let's say, five and four very simple numbers. Nothing, you don't need to do anything fancy. Uh, I can give you, for instance, um, I can say that, well, the elasticity of supply and demand is equal, which makes it a bit easier for you because then the, the volumes of uh, reduced demand and increased production will be the same. There will be a balance around this point and the same here. Because you can think of different elasticities on the demand and the supply curves and then it becomes a bit more messy. It's not very difficult, but I, uh, I will just keep it simple if, if this will be any, any topic at the exam. So <coughs> the effect in the low cost market, the exporting market will be a loss for the consumers equal to this area, a gain from the for the producers in terms of, uh, of profits of this area, and the net gain will be equal to this triangle in the exporting market. So the prices will be a bit higher, consumers will become a bit worse off, producers will become better off. So the net gain from trade will remain in the hands of the producers. So this is, and uh, it's easy to, when you have, th we have the volume exported and you have the change in prices, it's easy to calculate the net grain of trade. It's just the area of that triangle, right? So it's, it's not, not difficult. In the, High cost market, high cost country, you will have a, <coughs> a strong price decrease uh, because you will replace and you will replace some of the domestic production with imports. So this is the supply curve. <coughs> so we see that uh, this this distance here, uh, equal to 25,000 units, will be the reduced quantum of production in the high cost country. So the, the, so the American motorcycle industry, in this case, will, uh, will face a strong reduction in their, uh, their market. But because the prices are lower, the demand, because this is the demand curve, the demand for the for motorcycles in general will increase. So this is the increased demand because of the lower prices. So the price is initially here, the new price is here, and then you have the demand effect again equal to twenty five thousand. And then we see that <coughs> the producers here are suffering because of this reduced uh, volume. So the, the profits that they lose is the area, the change in the area above the supply curve, which is equal to this area. And you have all the numbers that you need to calculate the area. You have the change and you have the change here, and you have the change here. 
So it's it's not easy. It's simple geometry or whatever that it's <coughs> that you need here to to calculate the value of these areas. Um, and B is this area here is then also the reduced costs for the producers but the net effect for the producers is this area in terms of profits but the consumers <coughs> they get a very strong benefit according to this area right because they get a price uh, redu reduction from 2000 to 1000 and they gain what we call a consumer surplus equal to the, this whole area which is a change in the area below the demand curve which can also be calculated because this will be then equal to 2000 minus 1000 which is 1000 times 40 this is this area and then you add this triangle which is again 1000 times 65 minus 40 divided by 2 because it's a triangle it's not a it's not a square so this is a trapezoid actually that you calculate so this is the this trapezoid is the increased consumer surplus or the increased benefits for the consumers they consume more pay less and the net gain from trade will then be <coughs> the the um, benefits for the consumers minus the loss for the producers because they lose profits equal to this area so this triangle will then be the net gain trade in the high cost market here is B plus D and the ones who benefit in the high cost market is the consumers the are the consumers because they get lower prices and they will demand more the producers they lose because they get lower prices for their they get paid much lower for their products and they need to reduce production I can if you think about it if you if you think about your own country I, I'm quite sure that you will find examples where this fits quite well in Norway I think I mentioned that we had a textile industry which disappeared when trade was opened first with southern Europe and uh, in in more recent years with uh, with East Eastern Asia China and and, and uh, other countries uh, India not to mention India where uh, <coughs> the Norwegian textile industry is more or less gone it's a few of them left small specialized uh, manufacturers but very few it used to be a big industry exactly the same happened in the US when New York the textile industry was strong in New York and it disappeared over a period from 1960 to the end of the 70s whereas you can feel pretty sure that the consumers of uh, of textiles in the in the low cost countries they have suffered from this because the, the prices is probably a bit higher than they used to be some some decades back then the final point in this story <coughs> is about transport costs So what will happen here if you uh, increase the transport costs? Then the, uh, the um, pr 
price, the equilibrium price, will, will be higher. So this is the supply curve for, 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 the, for this good, in this case motorcycles. If we introduce a higher transport cost, then this will shift up like this. Let's say the new equilibrium price will be 1100. The effects here will be smaller so that the uh, benefits for the consumer consumers will be reduced. You will get the same shift here on the supply curve with the resulting reduced amount of exports. So the whole system will sort of be a bit choked, choked. Right, so the, 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 the volume of exports, the volume of imports will go down, the uh, equilibrium price will go up, and so on. And then a recalculation of all the areas will then have to be done to be able to see what will, uh, let's say, uh, an increase in transport costs of, let's say, uh, $50 per uh, bike or hundred dollars per bike, what will that entail in terms of, uh, of losses in terms of international trade? It should not be too hard to, to calculate that if, if, if need be by introducing a new uh, equilibrium price and then you need to have of course data for the effects on the on the different market segments. So if you get an exercise like that, if, then you will have the numbers. So what I'm after then is that you understand how this works in terms of, uh, of effects for, uh, for different groups and for the trade, the benefits of trade in, in general. Yep. Yep. Yes, it will. Because <coughs> if they if they impose a tax, you can you can consider that let's say from the consumer's point of view, let's say if they impose a tax of hundred on for each bike. Right? For me as a consumer I will then face a price of 1100 instead of 1000 because of this tax. And that can be handled in exactly the same way as if you increase the transport cost with 100. You shift the supply curve because the supply curve is, uh, is costs and also including taxes. So you can include the tax in the supply curve and you will get the same effect uh, all over. At least uh, you can you can uh, illustrate it that way with reduced exports, reduced imports and reduced gains from trade. That's why we have this international trade organization that sort of monitors and sets regulations on that kind of taxation because it's been a very strong focus on protectionism and that kind of taxes is a, is a way of protecting your domestic industry from competition. And it works in a way that you can increase the supply curve and then you get the new equilibrium prices and reduced gains from trade. Your country is uh, Brazil. <laughs> is, is doing that in a way, not by taxes, but just saying that uh, certain types of production should take place within the country's borders. So then the, let's say the supply curves goes to infinity and you don't, you are in this equilibrium, you, you, ha you, do, you don't simply have any trade of certain commodities. Um, the US motorbike industry was actually uh, protected 
by the American government because they impose taxes on, on uh, Japanese imports, leading to the same, but not as, as radical as just ban it like, uh, like, like some countries do, but they, uh, they regulated it, as I say, by, by introducing a tax and then reducing the volumes. To sorry. And totally deregulated international trade. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it even possible to have? Well, one has come quite a long way now in uh, in have a completely deregulated international trade for for a lot of commodities, but not all. Uh, it was listed in one of the previous slides that there are some strategic types of goods that are still subjected to international regulations. <coughs> your um, your oil and gas industry in, in Brazil is one example of that. You, you protect uh, certain activities like uh, like shipbuilders, I know, uh, by by saying that this should be a domestic uh, industry, the responsibility of the domestic industry. Whereas within uh <coughs> within the textile industry, I think that is more or less completely deregulated. But there are certain industries, like the defense industries, in many countries, are protected. The produce of weapons and vessels and what have you. Uh, so this is a mixed picture. But the, the trend is quite clear that it goes in the direction of more and more deregulated uh, global trade. But still there are, uh, there are uh, obstacles. Like, for instance, there is free trade within the EU, European Union, but it's not, but th there are um, taxes on trades between, let's say, EU and Japan. So Japanese cars produced in Japan are taxed if they are imported into the EU. Shifting this upwards and then the same story. And the Japanese, they are quite good with, <coughs> with calculators, so they they did uh, an exercise on that and set up a car factory inside of the EU instead. So they produce, Japanese cars are produced in the UK, as one example. And then they get, uh, they circumvent this tax problem and sell their cars in Europe and at the same conditions as the Germans and the French and the British do. But of course, perhaps at the slightly high costs but they still make profits out of it. So this simple uh, framework is quite useful for understanding a bit of what is going on within this uh, trade and uh, the consequences for volumes and hence then for transport flows and things like that. So <coughs> that was actually, uh, I think, exam 2012, question one, which more or less has been examined here now. Okay, I will we'll break there, I think we need.